Hello Vinyl community, long time no see, but it is high time to continue with another video. Now um, I have something here that uh, I was uh, interested to do for a week or so. Um, I kind of felt like it. I even made me notes, which is a first. And uh, so let's have a look at it. So this is basically about the year 1975 and 1976. And uh, in 74, Yes has released their seminal album Relaya, which is quite a fantastic piece of work. And uh, it marks um, something rather special, the collaboration with the Swiss keyboarder Patrick Moras. And um, so... Um, it's a known fact that uh, Rick Wakeman kind of didn't want to continue anymore and uh, uh, didn't like uh, the direction the music was going, etc. So uh, with Patrick Moras they made this wonderful album, which is actually one of my favorite albums by Yes. Um, very, very fascinating music, a beautiful cover and so on. Uh, I like everything about it, but uh, that's not what I want to talk about. What happened after Relay is quite interesting because the band kind of, uh, well, they didn't disband or something like that, but uh, they took a, a break from being a band and uh, decided that uh, each member of the current lineup would make one solo album. And the solo album, this, this, the sum of these five solo albums would somehow um, represent a kind of a virtual Yes album uh, based on solo efforts. Whatever that means, it's quite a strange convoluted idea and I wonder if uh, if Atlantic Records that would have to carry all the weight of these five productions, I wonder if they were rather shocked or happy about it. Maybe they were happy thinking, well, we get five albums out of it. Or they thought, oh damn, we have to produce five albums that basically no one will be interested in because people maybe want to hear the next Yes album and not an experiment as such. So um, that's what they did. And uh, I have them all here, the stack of five albums. And uh, I just, I don't know, I felt like I want to go back in time and just revisit this period and uh, just study these albums closer. Well, it was a nice enterprise. I really enjoyed that. And uh, um, some of the stuff I have heard a uh, very long time before. So I also revisited some of uh, some tracks that I've completely forgotten about, but um, it was quite, quite amazing. So in October 31, 1975, uh, the first of the five guys uh, finished his solo album and that was Steve Howe and his uh, debut solo album Beginnings. Um, now interestingly all five albums mark a debut for each individual musician um, in terms of solo albums. So none of these five people have ever made a solo album before so that's kind of interesting. And that's quite surprising because they've been doing it for quite a long time, all of them at this point, but uh, it seems like they never got around uh, to make a solo album at that point. So, uh, Steve Howe's album um, with the Roger Dean uh, cover design. It came in a gatefold sleeve with lyrics in it. Now it has a lot of guest musicians on it. Also from Yes, so there is uh, Alan White drumming on some tracks and Patrick Moraz is playing keyboards in some parts. Um, and there are three guys from the band Griffin on it. And all together, um, this is a solid uh, sort of a psychedelic uh, blues rock album uh, with uh, some touch of prog rock and a little bit of flamenco and of course some acoustic pieces by Steve Howe as you would expect. Now this album has one big problem and I'm most certainly not the first one to point it out. Um, Steve Howe had decided to sing all the tracks that had any vocals on it or any lyrics. And he was singing them with his own voice, which uh, turned out to be not such a good idea. 
Now, um, the thing is, uh, we are used to hear Steve Howe singing actually all the time, at least if you are listening to classical uh, Yes uh, albums, because uh, Yes always sang in harmony. Um, and what you quite well hear consciously is, of course, John Anderson's vocal, but also Chris Squire's vocal. There's the third voice in a lower register, which is Steve Howe. So it's more adding like a, like a flavor to it, you know, uh, a um, darker level. But uh, that doesn't mean that it's a very good sounding voice. I mean, it, it works well because he's, a, he's an accomplished musician, so he can sing pretty well in tune. And uh, so um, that's all right. But the voice in itself is quite horrendous. <laughs> So, I th I, this is a really uh, um, a bad idea, um, and uh, it certainly doesn't work. Now, um, I mean, the songwriting, it's not particularly good, I must say. And that is surprising, because uh, Steve Howe wrote almost like one half of Tales from Topographic Ocean, so uh, he certainly knows how to write uh, good material. But... Um, it's not that bad, to be to be honest. Um, well, um, are there, for example, memorable songs on it? Now, if you take a track like Australia, um, it's not a particularly good song, but the middle part suddenly slips into a very sort of yes-like instrumental part, which is quite cool. Um, there is a third track called The Nature of the Sea. Um, which um, is quite sweet. I mean, it's an, it's an instrumental that uh, pretty much uh, uh, saves you from uh, Steve Howe's voice. So the, the instrumentals are uh, actually the best thing about it. Um, yeah, um, um, a track like Willow the Wisp is actually quite good, but again, it suffers from the vocals. And uh, it's a solid song. I mean, again, reminiscent of certain parts of Yes recordings from this time and age. and. Uh, there is a track called Pleasure Stole the Night, which is a very sweet song, um, but very butchered by this anti-singer, to be honest. So, it would, actually, it would be nice to hear this album re-recorded with some good, uh, like, female vocalist or something. It's really had a sweet voice. This would probably turn out to be a, a nice recording. Yeah, um... Um, there is a song called Break Away From It All, um, which is the final track on this album. And it's a quite a good song. Even the vocals are almost bearable, kind of. Um, I mean, Eddie Offord, who uh, engineered this album, he must have sweated over these uh, recording sessions like crazy, just to somehow keep it together. Um, so um, it's more like a late 60s psychedelic track. Uh, and. Uh, more something you would probably expect from his time in Tomorrow. Maybe it's some older song that he had uh, in a drawer for a couple of years. Who knows? But um, it's rather tough to pick a really, really good track on this album. Now, it's not. I'm not saying that it's bad through and through, but um, um, it has good moments, certainly. But, um, well, it feels uh, sometimes really tainted by the vocal arrangements. Well, but of course, uh, great guitar playing, as you would expect. Um, there are a lot of different guitars on it, mandolins and uh, steel guitar and so on. Um, yeah, so um, good guitar playing, a um, bit unremarkable composing. And very, very under par singing here. So um, that's a good example for a bad artistic decision. But still, still from time to time I play this album and so it's more like you listen to it and you pick up a certain passage or a certain chunk of music that's uh, quite remarkable. But as a whole, well, it's a tough call, I'll tell you that. So, um, the same year, only a uh, only couple of days later, on November 7th, 1975, Chris Quire presented his results, Fish Out of Water. Now, for, for Steve Howe's album, to listen to it all the way through, you kind of need a bit of endurance and, uh, and, uh, and effort. The next one is, on the other hand, quite a big treat. I regard this as a great achievement. 
Um, it is a uh, very complex and melodic album that in a quite beautiful way combines elements of pop and rock music. So it's, it feels quite accessible in, in many parts. At the same time, uh, it's uh, yeah, it has a lot of interesting uh, progressive moments in it, uh, key changes and uh, interesting rhythm uh, rhythms and and signatures that uh, are all quite odd. It is certainly the progiest of the five albums if you look at it from a sort of a classical prog perspective. Again, it came out as a gate folder, a gatefold design. <laughs> Basically because these guys really had no shame and no limits <laughs> and demanded all kind of stuff all the time. So, um, so it's quite a beautiful album, the way it's designed. Uh, so uh, Squire's Fish Out of Water has probably most of the guest musicians appearing on it. Uh, again, there is Patrick Moraz playing a lot of drumming by Bill Bruford, um, and uh, you you have like there's Mel Collins playing saxophone on it. Mel Collins, who's basically from King Crimson and who played with the uh, Alan Parsons Project and Camel. And two things are quite interesting about this album that make it unique. On the one hand, it is a very close collaboration between Chris Squire and Andrew Price Jackman, who was his uh, band buddy from the days of The Sin, which was Chris Squire's 60s band, and here they reunite and, and um, well, Andrew Jackman, he quite contributed to this album, especially uh, where um, orchestral orchestration was in demand, and he made all, all kind of arrangements and wrote all kind of uh, sort of classical stuff. The other interesting thing about this album, and one maybe doesn't notice that after first listening, is that there are no guitars on it. So that's quite interesting. I mean, the dominant string instrument on this album, of course, is Chris Squire's bass guitar. And you can hear it a lot. Yeah, I mean, it's not true that there is no guitar on the album. There is a bit acoustic guitar, but that's all played by Chris Squire. But uh, no heavy riffs, no licks, no sort of... Uh, guitar oriented uh, music it starts with hold out your hand which is uh, which was a quite a successful song actually um and um it's so it's it's a typical example of, for this album because the song is very accessible it's a very poppy tune actually but it has this odd meter all the time so it's not a it's not an easy song to kind of clap with it because um it has a it has a way to change. Uh, it's not a it's not a four four song. There's a, something about it that's kind of a um, making these jumps, and um, yeah, that's how the prog guys like it um, to keep it interesting. Nice segue is to you by my side, which is a very sweet slow song. Um, let's not forget Chris Squire, um, even though a big uh, Pete Townsend fan was always very good at writing slow songs like listen to Onward on the Tormato uh, album by Yes this is a very overlooked track and very beautiful um, so You By My Side um, is in the same vein uh, very slow and very dreamy a beautiful track and it has wonderful vocal arrangements I mean that's the other thing Squire was not, not only a great bass player he was a wonderful vocal arranger he knew how to how to use uh, vocals and languages to create interesting harmonies and melodies and this works very well on this track. Uh, the third and last track on the A side is Silently Falling uh, which uh, is probably this sort of a proggy highlight of this album which is very fascinating and very very strange. There's also something so typical about Chris Choir that he takes language and he kind of he kind of creates his own sort of emphasis on certain vowels it's it's not how you would usually sing it but it works for him and it's it creates it creates a strange uh, trance like atmosphere very interesting it starts in a very calm fashion with flutes and oboes and uh, well it quickly builds up into this great operatic uh, prog song so i like it uh, um 
the open on the B side is a track called Lucky Seven. And um, did I make some notes about that? Uh, there's a nice sax playing by Mel Collins, uh, but the song is very funky. It has a very dominant bass guitar and uh, it kind of shows you why typical distorted rock guitar was actually not necessary on this album. And then there's only one song left, which is called Safe. And uh, that's sort of the big suite, the big composition on this album. It's 15 minutes long and it's a... Uh, well, it's a prog rock cathedral of sounds and experiments and uh, it starts with wonderful, interesting and very melodic bass playing and um, there's a strong thematic build-up. So the whole track runs like a as, a as a canon of sorts with melodies and vocals kind of replacing each other and uh, moving forward and building up and up uh, in a very quirky sort of 11.4 meter so uh, again it's very it's very edgy in terms of, of rhythm yeah uh, it's a very strange song very dramatic so to speak and um, then there's this beautiful ending the, the album ends in a strange ambient atmosphere covered only by the bass guitar played by Chris Choir and it's sort of uh, so Peter's out of the album. It's very fascinating. So um, it's the kind of album when it's over you think like, yeah, this could have been a double album. I would love to hear much more of this stuff. So um, um, it's one of those strange, um, strange uh, things. In music history, that Chris Qua didn't make like 20 solo albums. I mean, if if this would be the if this would be the the blueprint for the music he would make as a solo musician, man, he should have made a solo album every year. Wonderful. So this was November 1975, and um, um, I believe that when this came out, uh, the other three guys that were still working on their solo albums when they heard this they certainly all thought damn we certainly must uh, step up and uh, <laughs> create something that can keep up <laughs> with this masterpiece so a wonderful wonderful album fish out of water chris choir so um in april 1976 um so uh, almost half a year later the next one arrived, which was Ramshackled by the drummer Alan White. Now, um, one thing I can tell you right away about this album is that uh, of all the five, this is by far the most underrated. It's not very well known, so sadly it's quite forgotten in the annals of uh, rock history. And I can really recommend this to everyone. Oh, this is a beautiful, beautiful listen. Now, this album has been criticized for being incoherent. All Music gave it only two stars, assholes, uh, which is total bullshit. It's very unfair, I would say. It is true that on release this album was predominantly exposed to pro rock audience, which obviously did not find it very appealing. Well, because it's not a pro album, that's the problem. But it's a very good album. If you come to terms with its eclectic nature, I quite like it. So for me, there are a lot of highlights on this album. Um, it starts with the Ooh Baby going to pieces, which is a great soul track. Now I can understand why this album was not a success, because uh, it was released to a progressive rock audience. And that tends to be sometimes a little bit narrow-minded. Um, One Way Rack is uh, the next track, which is a very, very great funky song, quite groovy. Um, again, I don't know why people complain about this album, because uh, uh, today, in this time and age, most of the bands would give a lot if they could record an album like that. I mean, wow! <laughs> this, if this came out today, people would hail it like, this is the album of the year, yeah! <laughs> Radiohead! <laughs> they only wish they could record something like that. Now the third song, Avakak, is one of the big highlights on this album. And uh, it's more in the vein of maybe Weather Report or uh, 
it's a great jazz fusion, extremely wild and crazy. Amazing drumming, of course. Um, there are a lot of uh, exciting percussion elements on this album, which is not surprising. Um, and the final track on the A side is called Song of Innocence and features John Anderson and Steve Howe. Definitely another highlight here. Um, wonderful, dreamy track. Uh, another perfect example of John Anderson's amazing vocals. And a very sweet song as well. So, um, now on the B-side you have track like Giddy and Silly Woman, which, um, especially Silly Woman, this is sort of a reggae calypso track. Uh, so it's very groovy, nice listen. And the album ends with a track called Darkness Part 1 to Part 3, which is a very sophisticated jazz track, uh, very calm and very emotional. Great song and quite dreamy. So, um, yeah, I can tell you only good things about this album. This is very underrated and uh, it doesn't get shown around very much. This is it's not a it's not it's no um, it's no a rare find. So you can get this if you find it somewhere, you will probably pay two dollars for it. But um, wonderful music, wonderful music. I mean, it's it's kind of a um, it's a mystery to me why it gets such a bad rap. But maybe because it received these lukewarm or negative reviews at the beginning and it kind of stuck with it. I don't know. So uh, by now we are in the middle of the summer 1976 uh, in June. And that's when the mysterious Patrick Moraz came with his album The Story of I. So this came in a gatefold sleeve design and uh, it's actually I think it's the only one that was not released on Atlantic but on Charisma, here with the big face of Patrick Moraz. A uh, lot of uh, liner notes and lyrics and this inlay here. And um, yeah, so uh, the, the album has some kind of uh, uh, conceptual aspect to it. It's a concept album of sorts. I will not tell you much about the concept because I'm so ignorant to concepts. I love progressive music and probably half of my albums are somehow concept albums. I just, I never found the time to pay attention to the concepts. I'm kind of in it for the music and for the moment. And uh, so, um, so the concepts oftentimes remain kind of elusive to me. Or I know a little bit about it, but it just doesn't uh, raise my attention that much. So how is the music here? Well, it's all written and arranged by Patrick Moraz. And, um, well, let's make no mistake here. Just in terms of mere musicianship uh, and musical knowledge and ability, he might have been by far the most capable of all the five people here. I mean, I mean Patrick Moraz as a musician, that's really a top league. I mean, you may not like all the projects he's been involved in, or maybe you do, but uh, just simply from a musically technical point of view he might have easily be the most talented musician that ever appeared in a yes lineup controversial but i think that's the case so this music is really really pumped up with the ideas and uh, probably uh, probably the most it's it's the most demanding album uh, in many sense because there's just so many music on it and uh, it's not a double album, it's a simple album, but uh, it's packed with with themes and um, he doesn't get lost in the repetition. It's always something new and it's a lot of lot of jazz fusion in it. And um, But also it's beautifully combined with the Brazilian music. So Brazilian music plays a big role here. Interesting arrangements with, with the children choirs and uh, with the uh, whole uh, rhythm sections and it works remarkable it's wonderful it's a great album there are some really good people playing on it you have Jeff Berlin who's playing bass guitar that's a good choice isn't it <laughs> Alphonse Mouzon on drums Andy Newmark on drums so there's all kind of stuff going on um, there's a great build-up uh, through the first two tracks straight away into some jazz fusion mayhem pretty cool stuff kind of a Billy Cobham style, I would say, uh, mixed with a sort of a yes-y, yes-like vocals. It's pretty interesting. Now this album it contains a lot of short tracks, some of them hardly longer than two or three minutes. That's just 
very typical for this album. He seemed to have been really flooded with musical ideas, so uh, he uh, never used more than two, three minutes for one idea. So there's place for more. <laughs> there's a track called Intermezzo, which um, shows two parallel female voices, and it's quite beautiful. There are a lot of, it's not only a wild, a wild uh, mayhem album, there are a lot of calm moments, uh, very amazing, sweet, uh, mesmerizing songs like, like this Intermezzo. Uh, it's kind of like Renaissance, if you remember the 70s band Renaissance. Uh, it's kind of in that uh, this strange mixture of flamenco and baroque music. Um, incredible. Then there's a, another great track called Best Years of Our Lives. Very existential, very daring with cool synth sounds and uh, yet, yet very romantic and sad and th at the same time. It's quite impressive. Now it's not like I'm excited about everything on this album. There are tracks like Descent which are a little bit hard to swallow, I think, uh, but they're also very short, like 1 minute 45 seconds and stuff, so relax, it's very survivable. So this album is quite overboarding with ideas and basically you can't, you can't digest everything uh, after, after one listen, it's just too much stuff going on and uh, too many themes, too many ideas. I will not go into all tracks here. The album is very rich with material and would actually take some time to comment on every track. Uh, so altogether this is a very entertaining jazz fusion album, but it's also very impressive to look at it as a prog album, basically. And not many prog musicians ever try to merge progressive music or progressive rock with the Brazilian beats and African rhythms. But it's all here, it's all here. So this is quite an expedition to get into this record and I can certainly recommend it. So, The Story of I by Patrick Moraz, or if you want to pronounce it somewhat in a more Swiss manner, it's probably something like Patrick Moraz, or something like that, I don't know. <laughs> so, uh, finally, the last of the five albums got released, and who was the last to deliver, of course, John Anderson. This whole thing was probably his idea anyway, um, and... Uh, so what did he get out of it? Well, he got like 18 months uh, break from the other guys who were constantly harassing him. So I think this was the whole idea behind it. So um, Elias of Sun Hello was John Anderson's first uh, solo record. Um, and um, it turned out to be quite an achievement. Now, um, let's uh, realize one thing that... Um, John Anderson, wonderful musician, amazing singer, but um, yeah, technically speaking, as being as a member of Yes, it means that you are constantly surrounded by these super instrumentalists that that uh, just so good at their instruments, uh, and that was never something where he could keep up in any way. So I mean, he's a he kind of play a bit guitar and a bit keyboards, and he likes to play the harp and uh, maybe some flute. So that's certainly the interesting thing about this album, that it's a very progressive album. It's, it's an album that has a, that's getting a lot of respect from prog fans, yet um, it's, not, uh, it's not created by a famous multi-instrumentalist or, or a prog guitar god or super keyboardist or something like that. It's someone who just kind of knows his thing and uh, who just knows how to put the talents and his own abilities to an optimal use. So uh, it's not a typical rock album, because he's not a typical rock musician. And, uh, uh, well, the one thing interesting about it is that he plays all the instruments on it. So it's a, it's a complete, isolated uh, John Anderson experiment. And um, it has a lot of uh, rhythms on it, uh, it, has, it has a lot of uh, uh, keyboard music on it, but, um, but uh, they are all utilized in a very smart way, simply because he's not this kind of uh, extraordinary instrumentalist, so he's using it in a smart way. He's created more like trance-like uh, patterns and layers and uh, so the music can build up in a very nice and dramatic way, yet uh, it's not an album filled with complex guitar solos and keyboard solos. It's, it's very different. Uh, it's a, now this is a very, very uh, 
intense uh, concept albums. So in this case, even I kind of dabbed into the concept of it all because you can't ignore it. By the way, also came out as a nice gatefold sleeve. Um, this time with the with like a little booklet inside with all the lyrics. I mean, this kind of beautiful stuff usually gets lost in the CD, of course. So there's a lot of graphic material inside, kind of telling the telling the whole story of Elias of Sun Hello, and this is like a science fiction fantasy story about uh, sort of a foreign. Uh, alien civilization living somewhere on a different planet. Here's the inner sleeve. Yeah, so uh, this is the kind of music that uh, is quite fun to listen. Oh, by the way, the cover may look kind of Roger Dean-ish, yet it's not made by Roger Dean, interestingly. So the album cover design has been uh, kind of put uh, in the patronage of Hypnosis. But it has been all graphically designed by Dave Rowe. But of course, if you look at it, you kind of feel like the um, the task was uh, look at sort of uh, Roger Dean, what the, he did for years, and try to be somehow consistent with it. Obviously, here this sort of uh, this fantasy spaceship-like thing is uh, most certainly uh, inspired by. The one on Fragile, but that's a kind of known fact. So uh, the album starts with Ocean Song, and um, well, there has been always some speculation that Vangelis was part of this production, and the reason is probably this opening song, Ocean Song, uh, that sounds very much like Vangelis did sound in exactly those years. But this is all written and performed by Anderson. Although, in exactly those months when this solo album has been recorded, um, John Anderson had collaborated with Vangelis on his uh, album Heaven and Hell. And that came out in December, uh, the year before. And so it's quite obvious that John uh, was probably heavily influenced by this collaboration. Um, there's certainly some inspiration uh, that you can feel on this album coming from Vangelis. The next track, Meeting, Garden of Geda slash Sound Out the Galleon, is a very nice vocal oriented song uh, showing some typical John Anderson melodies. Um, Dance of Ranyard and Olias, this is the third track and this track really shows you where the power of this album lies. So the dominant instrument on this track is certainly the harp. And harps are usually instruments that you don't hear a lot on albums. Probably with the exception of Dead Can Dance or maybe uh, Dorothy Ashby. <laughs> now the second part of the song, um, there is more speed and dynamics and uh, simple yet very cool bass guitar kind of driving the patterns home. And uh, also there's a lot of strange synthesizer craziness going on. So I guess that's the result of the fact that John Anderson did the whole album just alone on his own. So there was no one there in the studio to tell him to cut the rubbish <laughs> off <laughs> and stop it. So, so there are some interesting strange moments on this album that are, are maybe a little too much, but I don't know. So um, yeah, um, then there's a fourth track called and now we get deep into sort of a John Anderson fantasy language called Cockwalk and Transic. Um, um, which is probably the epic highlight on this album. This is probably the most powerful song here. Uh, it's driven by the sound of uh, Saz or Baglama, which is sort of a Turkish uh, instrument. Or sort of a Middle Eastern sort of a lute, lute-like or guitar-like instrument. You've certainly seen it somewhere has a very distinctive sound. So there's a certain so certain ethnographic vibe to this track. Um, it's it's very uh, sort of trance-like with a lot of, a lot of uh, percussions in it and all kind of choirs created by Anderson. Um, quite amazing. Um, it's, it's, it's all probably just a composite of John's voice, 
uh, that's just overdubbed like a dozen times, but it sounds like a whole room of full of John Anderson, so it's quite amazing. It's a very powerful, powerful song. Um, and uh, then the A-side ends with a track called Flight of the Morglade, which is a typical John Anderson happy song, but certainly a nice, uplifting, folky listen, uh, combined with these sort of a Vangelis type of keyboards. And then we turn it over and come to the B-side, which starts with a track called Solid Space. It's another rather ethereal song, very dramatic build-up though. Uh, a lot of great bold vocal elements here. I guess John Anderson just knew that he was the only guy in the world that could pull off this kind of singing, honestly. So uh, his vocal qualities are paying off here pretty well and uh, they are used in a very smart way, making it uh, quite a unique track um, that probably no one ever will record as a cover version because it's it's all such such an authentic John Anderson stuff. You you could not you could not let another musician, another voc vocalist record it. it. Just probably wouldn't work. So next track on the B side is uh, Moon Ra slash Chord slash Song of Search. Now this is the longest track on the album and certainly another progressive highlight. It is based on a sort of a spiritual chanting, not sounding like it's related to any particular culture, but it has a sort of a, sort of exotic vibe to it, which makes it interesting. In terms of the overall conceptual story behind the album, so there are all these vocal loops that keep adding and growing and adding to the drama of the song. Um, in the second half of the track, there's also some beautiful, very calm moments, very acoustic. There's some wonderful music there. And finally, the last track on this album is called To The Runner. And um, that's another uplifting track. Obviously, this is not a very dark album as a whole. So uh, here, all the ideas of this record come together again, united to this uh, sort of a cheerful, glorious track that then fades into sort of a last section of electronic music uh, and then it's all over. Yeah, one could argue that the sound has aged a bit, especially in the synthesizer department of this album, certainly, but that has never bothered me. I like the sounds, they are part of the age of this album and um, that's all right for me. And the other thing is, it is one of those albums that pass by very quickly and that is usually a sign of quality. So uh, I was kind of thinking about um, which of these five albums is the best. And I'm not able to answer that. It's impossible to say. They are all quite different and have all strength and even some weaknesses. Anderson's Olaya is certainly the most unique and original in terms of sound and ideas. Patrick Moraz's album is pretty much um, the most musical one, I would say, being almost inexhaustible as a source of sort of a musical study. Almost, I want to almost use the word research. <laughs> but in the same way, it can be a bit tiring. And uh, Alan White's album is very underrated, certainly. It is a pretty good music with very charming uh, moments in it, uh, ideas and great musicianship. Once you come to terms with, with the eclectic nature, of the album and that it basically doesn't have any kind of individual handwriting with uh, which probably has to do with the fact that Alan White had hired a whole a whole uh, group of friends slash musicians to not only play on the album but to write the individual songs so you get this strange uh, mixture of different compositions Steve Howe's album has, has certainly some nice moments on it, but uh, as I said, uh, the vocal part is tedious and it remains a mystery to me how this got recorded under Eddie Offord's uh, supervision. And finally, Chris Squire's album, which in hindsight has been the most successful, I guess, um, is probably the most focused one and uh, with the strongest themes and a very, very convincing overall musical package, I would say. So it would not be particularly original if I would call it the best album of those five. Also maybe very closely followed by John Anderson's album uh, and those of uh, Patrick Morris and Alan White. But it might be that Fish Out of Water is just 
the best one in this batch, probably. Uh, but I would totally understand if your favorite one is uh, maybe Olias or The Story of I, or even Ramshackled. Now, Alan White's album is certainly the most underrated here, and uh, therefore uh, deserves, uh, I think, the most attention. Um, it might be eclectic, but it has only good or even great songs on it. It certainly doesn't deserve to be forgotten. Now, I don't know if you are into mixtapes and stuff. Uh, it's a bit of a lost art, uh, which I'm still whining about most of the time, to be honest. I mean, I remember those wonderful days when we made mixtapes. Now, these five albums, great stuff to make a good mixtape. I mean, you can kind of... Um, it's like the source material to your own... Um, virtual yes album so to speak uh, so you can uh, create your own unique yes album by choosing those tracks that you find the best the yes album that never was so to speak so uh, that, that's that now uh, interestingly um, there's just not a nice round closure to this story because uh, at the end of this process in 1976 the band just didn't get together and just recorded the next Yes album. Um, but what ha what did happen was that suddenly Rick Wakeman was back. And uh, under circumstances that uh, I'm not too familiar with and that kind of remain a mystery, I think, um, Patrick Moras was uh, pushed out of the project for whatever reasons. But I guess it's just maybe maybe Wakeman just signaled that he wants to be back or whatever and so they thought well it's Rick so goodbye Patrick I don't know so the next album was of course going for the one um, without Patrick Moras and um, it's a bit of a pity I mean I like this album I have no problems with it but I certainly after the really wonderful results of Relaya I would have liked to hear another Yes album with Patrick Moras, but it's Yes, I mean, it's the biggest soap opera in rock history and um, we will spend years and decades of our lives trying to figure out what's wrong with these guys and why they keep firing each other all the time for 50 years now. Um, it's obviously some, uh, some uh, unintentional part of their mystery. So that's it. A bit long this time, but maybe you kind of liked it. Um, I enjoyed the process of listening to these five albums for almost two weeks uh, through and through and getting more familiar with them again. Um, it was certainly enjoyable and um, I hope it inspired you maybe as well to put one or other out of this collection on your own turntable. So. Um, Nice to do this again and uh, see you next time. Keep it spinning and goodbye.